Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, third panel on FX options. Um, is it the next wave for FX? And is 2014 the year FX options will break out? Um, uh, it's an interesting discussion, I think. Um, we have a great panel with us. And uh, first, I'd just like to make an introductory remark, and then we'll have the panel introduce themselves. Um, I think for anybody who's been in the foreign exchange business for any length of time, you could probably, at any point in time, say FX options are going to be the next big thing. Um, the value proposition has always been incredibly powerful. Um, and you know everyone's just been waiting for it to, to kind of blossom. I think you can make a stronger argument in 2014 for a couple of reasons. One is, um, certainly on the institutional side, we all know those two words, Dodd-Frank, right? So driving options and uh, NDFs onto exchanges and exchange-like structures, including CEFs. Um, so that's clearly a, a pretty, um, very, very powerful driver uh, once the regulators you know, get everything in line. Um, I think the other thing that's happening, uh, obviously, uh, at a shift event, you know, the retail story is always uh, at the forefront. So I think the other thing that's very powerful uh, on the retail side is there's been this tremendous growth of uh, retail spot foreign exchange around the world. In the US, it probably dates back to somewhere around 2001, 2002. Um, there's been a nice run. Volumes have been growing. Everything's been great. Um, but that's beginning to plateau out. And so the question is, you know, what's next? What are, what are the clients going to do? What are the brokers going to do? Basically, what's everyone's going to do? Uh, I think there's also this curious, we're in this curious point in time where their market volatility is low. And obviously, when you talk about volatility, you, it's just another way of talking about options. So hopefully that would be a driver as well, although it's hard to trade in these markets using any product. Um, so I think that those are, that's just to, to give you a backdrop. And as I said, I'd like the panel to briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll launch into the discussion. Uh, Stephen Ryder, if you could start at the end, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Stephen Ryder. Uh, my company is called Sentry Derivatives. We bring an FX options platform along with liquidity from uh, a multi-bank liquidity and the liquidity of our own so we can service both retail customers, options that are as small as options on 10,000 of the underlying, 10,000 euros, $10,000, uh, through an online platform which is complete using the FX Bridge platform, complete with uh, risk management tools, et cetera. Uh, previously, I was global head of FX options for Citibank and I left and I wanted to bring, uh, open up this market to a much broader audience, which is what we're doing. I'm John Nigerian. Um, I uh, uh, was originally a football player, uh, the other kind of football, not the one they're showing out there. Um, as Mike Ditka said, uh, if God wanted us to play soccer, he wouldn't have given us hands. Um, <laughs> for all of my soccer playing friends out here. But anyway, uh, I, I played football in Chicago, and it was the home of some of the biggest exchanges in the world. So I worked down on the floor there for years. And now uh, my brother and I started a firm called Trade Monster and Option Monster. Trade Monster is a brokerage firm. Option Monster is a media company. And so uh, we are fortunate enough we get to talk about trading and in particular options on CNBC virtually every day. And uh, we just did a deal with General Atlantic. There was a big merger between uh, Option House and uh, Trade Monster with General Atlantic uh, in the mix as well. So. We're looking for big things going forward. Still optimistic. I'm Dan Kerrigan. I serve as president of the NASDAQ Futures Exchange. But in my previous life, I was head of new product development for what was called the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, an options exchange, part of NASDAQ OMX Group. And I created a new class of options, US dollar settled FX options. I guess I could say in that kind of role, I was really more of a, a leader. but. Uh, I also have my background. I used to work out with uh, John and his brother Pete in Chicago for many years <laughs> before the markets opened. But I think in that role, instead of being a leader, I was a follower. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were a leader. No. But I want to just say on behalf of NASDAQ OMX Group that we're uh, greatly honored to be a premier sponsor of the Shift Forex event. And they have been a super group with which to work. And we're very proud to put our name with Shift. So thank you for having us here today, Peter. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Stephen Best. I'm the CEO of FX Bridge Technologies. We're a technology company that makes software 
for banks and brokers for derivatives trading uh, across asset classes. Our primary focus now is on the uh, FX option side, and I, I don't work out. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you do. <laughs> That's great. And just one sort of housekeeping note. Um, it's been a, you know, we're, we're honored to have doc, uh, Dr. John, John Najarian with us today. He does have to catch a flight back to Chicago, so um, he'll have to leave sort of in the middle of the panel. And you but guys screwed it up by watching so much of that Italy-Costa Rica game <laughs> and stretching the panels out. Uh, it's all true. Um, but anyway, um, as we be began uh, addressing this topic with the panel, and I think uh, probably everyone's experienced it, you look at the FX options question, and uh, the, the big parallel is equity options. You know, obviously a huge success, tremendous volumes from both retail and institutional, um, and it's sort of the ideal or model that you know everyone in FX is, is looking at. So, uh, John, if I could just go back uh, to you and say, you know, from in the early days, let's say similar to now with FX options, you know, what were the sort of drivers of the popularity and, and uptake of, of sure. equity options? Um. And there are a number of parallels uh, that we can draw. I started in 1981, and as most of you recall, uh, the stock market was pretty much dead in the water. Uh, there was nothing going on in 1981. The Dow was, uh, what, was it a miserable low number? And uh, the volumes uh, that traded were about 47 million shares a day on the New York Stock Exchange and so forth. Um, Options uh, were very low volatility at that time. And then the market started a bull run that lasted it until 87, a uh, very strong bull run. People were more interested, of course, in options because as the run started, they could get the leverage that they wanted that we all know you can get about two for one leverage because of the margin accounts in stock. Um, and options gave much closer to an FX sort of uh, potential where you could get 50 to 1, 100 to 1, even 200 to 1 sort of leverages with the option contract. And that really started volume spiking. Volumes back then for options were trading about 450,000 contracts a day. Uh, running into uh, 87, we were well into the millions uh, per day. Barry Noble knows that as well as Dan. Uh, as far as how that just jumped, the volumes jumped. Now we're doing 17 million a day on average this year, um, even though volatilities are low. And obviously one of the parallels that I can't draw is that uh, FX, for all of you who are practitioners, you guys know, and Stephen and I were talking about it outside, in the US it's 50 to one. In um, parts of the world it's over 200 to one uh, for FX, so what's the reason to trade options? when you've got that much leverage in the product. And I would say the, the, the protective part of options, not just buying a put, but the idea that you have a, uh, a commitment with the option uh, limited to what you paid for the option. So when I'm buying a directional bet, a call option for the upside of a particular FX trade, um, that's my risk, rather than this open-ended risk that I have with buying FX outright just like buying a, a very volatile stock outright at 200 to one leverage. I don't care if it's Apple or what it is, you'd be blowing guys out of the water every day uh, if we did that with stocks. And so uh, I think options on FX are the natural migration and that uh, uh, the other thing I'd hit on is that Bitcoin may or may not be a great idea, but when Mt. Gox happens, it focuses people in on contraparty risk. Um, who's holding your, who's the clearing firm, or who stands between you when you're making the trades and things? And that's another one of the real promises of uh, FX options, even though it's in its infancy and there are situations like what Dan is doing over at uh, Philly, there are also huge liquidity pools that people can hit for uh, FX and FX options, some of which may migrate onto um, exchange platforms so that you don't have that counterparty risk. And that's gonna be huge, I think, as far as a driver, because then you'll see more folks getting behind the product 
than are presently behind it. So in other words, infancy, uh, and uh, very optimistic about where it grows. Fantastic, and Dan, that's an, almost a natural segue to where you sit at NASDAQ in terms of the exchange. What, what's your perspective as sort of where we are in the development and you know, what do you see driving things forward? Well, we first have one issue in that FX options are the greatest secret to retail investors in this country. Why? They're hidden from their view, yet every retail investor has the ability to trade FX options today if they have an online securities account. And that may go to say that they just need to put in the trading symbol, but one of the other issues that we have is education. So, John, you're on TV each day. You're touting option strategies, perhaps on Apple. Mm -hmm. Somebody uh, looks at you on TV and they go, I want to do that. They go online and they put in the trading symbol, AAPL, hit the options chain, they know exactly what they can do. We have that same wherewithal with a simple symbol, XDE, for the euro. But we don't have folks on TV touting option strategies on FX yet. And it's another part of the puzzle, what I call, you know, not only it's a hidden secret, but it's a hidden opportunity. And I think we need to have more of a community effort for education, for FX. Distribution's there. 100 million securities accounts in this country. How many of them are options approved? I don't know, but 100% of those options approved accounts could trade FX options today. Huge untapped opportunity for this entire industry sitting here. Uh, that's great. Um, I'm wondering, Stephen Ryder, if I could ask you, in the, uh, you're out there, you're working with brokers, you're bringing clients onto the platform. You know, one of the things we see in any asset class that is, as, and as John outlined, you're making a leveraged directional bet, be it oil futures or FX in whatever form. Um, ha the experience of the options trading clients, does it differ from spot? Is it sort of a more sustainable model? Or maybe you could talk a bit, little bit about sure. that. Sure, sure. I just want to say, first of all, uh, on, on the introduction, talking about uh, is options the next big thing. Let's not forget that options is FX options is the largest options market in the world of any asset class. Right? It's a huge market. Uh, it's uh, $330 billion of options trade each day, according to the VIS survey. And options had the biggest growth of any category of the FX market. But where it's lacking, of course, is in retail, the retail access. And um, so my experience so far in bringing the platform and bringing the liquidity to retail customers is uh, small retail customers that have learned to trade spot FX through their favorite broker may not have the knowledge to trade FX options. They don't understand the product. They do understand this thing called binary options because they're really easy to understand. In the next five minutes, how fast can I lose my money? <laughs> but when it comes to real options and the power of protecting your portfolio or selling options in a quiet market, what can you do with spot? You can just sit around, you can try to job your position for a few pips, or you can sell some strangles and take in some income. So options have great power. People who understand options from other markets, they see our platform, they see the liquidity, they see the streaming prices, click and deal, risk management, they say, wow, I didn't know this was available. I didn't know I had access to this market. And that's really what we're doing, is we're trying to open up the FX options market to any trader uh, to come online and trade and click and deal. But it's something of a battle actually with the brokers themselves, because we work through the broker. Brokers bring FX products to the clients, to their clients. To get them to bring FX options to their clients, they have to move beyond their current uh, small uh, market and thinking about spot FX, which is very simple, and getting into options and opening up. You know, spot's easy. Remember, a lot of FX companies are first and foremost marketing companies and customer service companies. If they get more into trading, more into education, they can really open up a great product to their customers. And the total rate of return of our customers and all, across all the customers we have is well in excess of 50% over the last 12 months, which is a great thing for a broker who's trying to advertise the profitability of his customer business. Can't say the same for binary options. That's very good. Uh, Stephen Best, do you have? Anything to add on that topic? Well, I, I think the uh, the concept that people are talking about about education is important. Um, if you look at you know, John, John was talking previously about the history on the uh, FX, or the uh, equity option side. Um, companies that have been very successful, like Thinkorswim, which got bought by six, for $600 million by TD Ameritrade, Options Express a billion dollars by Charles Schwab. Uh, a lot of that valuation was due to training, webinars, uh, uh, people with companies 
uh, like John's, that trained people how to trade options. And uh, so brokers today in the FX space say, well, you know, are people trading options? Should we do this? Shouldn't we do this? If you took the top 50 FX brokers in the world, they probably spend literally tens of millions of dollars a month on training, on webinars, on, on conferences, on advertising for spot effects, which you could argue is one of the easier products to trade. So you know, if, if you're willing to put a little bit of resource into option trading, I think the valuations I mentioned uh, are, are definitely a potential. But it's just not going to happen without people breaking a bit of a sweat. And in your experience, uh, you know, providing the technology platform for this over several years, have you seen the reception at the broker level change in any way over the past few years? Are there, is there more interest growing? And it, it definitely. It, it was early on, and I've, I've been with FX Bridge for, for four years. Uh, early on, it was a bit of a struggle. And even uh, large brokers that have taken our platform, you know, just getting them to kind of dip the toe in the water and do it. But once they did it and they saw the revenue potential, uh, they were extremely happy that we browbeat them into turning the thing on. Uh, and what's interesting about FX options is the, the revenue potential for a broker in terms of the, sp the spread income they can earn is huge because option spreads are much wider than, than spot spreads. A lot of what Stephen was talking about with the uh, educational side of it, um, we do a lot of that, but we haven't to this point done it for FX options, um, but we do uh, technical analysis, we do stock market training, options training, and so forth. And obviously an option is an option is an option. Um, and what we find is extremely successful for clients on the equity side, I think will be the same uh, successful products on the FX side, and that is spreading. Um, the biggest problem that folks end up getting into is the time decay involved in they buy a wasting asset, a call option or a put option. Uh, so to your point, when they're selling straddles or strangles against an FX position, they're obligating themselves, if they're selling a straddle, to deliver the, the FX or the to buy more if it drops because they're selling a call and a put. But they're getting paid to do that. They're the house. They're keeping the money. So they have the opposite problem of the folks that are just out there buying premium and seeing it wasting away. Um, we find that customers end up be, being more successful when they, uh, not, not that they're not successful doing that one, Stephen, because I think they are, but when they want to place a dir directional bet on an FX currency, you know, when they're doing a currency trade, then if they're bullish on that trade to have a simple call vertical spread or to sell a put credit spread. Um, both of those trades, limited risk, um, great uh, in terms of margin, whether it's equities or whether it's FX, uh, cuts the risk way down for them, time decay, volatility, all those things that somewhat scare people when they're just getting started are all of a sudden not so scary because for every option I'm buying, I'm selling one, so I'm taking care of a little of that time decay, a little of the volatility compression and all that sort of thing. So I'm demystifying it and making it easier for somebody to place that directional bet. Yeah, they have a limited amount of upside if, if indeed it's a call vertical spread on a particular trade, but um, they're, the money they're committing is like this. They don't have unlimited risk and they tend to like that. And they tend to be able to stay at the table longer and those that do stay at the table longer get returns more like what Steven's talking about over here, you know, and having a 50% return rather than getting burned out or doing a binary trade and getting flipped like that. John, I think what you're saying for FX options is that countries may have borders, but when it comes to FX options, there are no borders. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to offer option strategies that have up to six legs. So anything that you were to put out a strategy, even as complicated as an iron condor, could be done with FX options. So the applicability there is, is there. I think the interesting uh, seat at which we sit at NASDAQ is that we have a customer feedback line that sits on about five of our desk. It's always a race to see who won't answer it first, but <laughs> by the fourth ring, we always pick it up. <laughs> but here's what's different in the last uh, six months. 
Before the start of this year, the phone never rang and asked, hey, can you tell me about those FX options or how these work or whatnot? But now the phone has started to ring, and they're all asking about one country in terms of FX options. Anybody want to take a guess what the one country is? I have no prizes to give away here, but we have the nice blow-up uh, soccer balls at our desk. Switzerland or Japan? You don't count, sir. Anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> no. No? Sure. Sure. Ruble? I, I say in respect for my friend Stephen, I'm not going to sing O oh, Canada, but it mm -hmm. is the Canadian or the loony that we're getting the most amount of calls on. It's beautiful. It's a, it's a unique example where I think, John, you're always looking for trading examples of pair trades and stocks. Mm -hmm. Here's a two for one in the Canadian dollar. You can trade price direction, but you also have the crude oil input, big right. energy. So you're making two bets in one, and I think that's what I th think is going to open up more interest for this marketplace. Hey, I can do more than just figure out the direction of these uh, currencies. I can make macroeconomic bets. I don't know, Steve, if you would agree, uh, coming from the homeland. <laughs> no, I, I think that's, uh, that, that, that's extremely important, but also uh, uh, when people, we, we talked a lot about the, the number of equity uh, accounts that are approved for option trading in this country, and that what you folks are doing in Philadelphia, in my view, is a mechanism to re for a broker to really attack the US FX options market in a way that doesn't involve Dodd-Frank, doesn't involve the NFA. Uh, but when you talk about education and strategies, you can talk to people about, well, okay, Russia's just invaded Crimea. How is that gonna affect my equity portfolio and what can I do in the FX options space to ensure that? So there's, a, there's just a wealth of strategies that can be pitched to people that, uh, that, that get them to trade more, to get them to trade longer, to get them to protect their portfolios so they will trade longer. Um, so everybody wins. Let, let me ask you two C's. So do you, are you, what would you say to the question, can a regulated market for FX options live next to an unregulated market and can they both grow? What's an unregulated market for FX options? OTC. Ah. OTC is regulated, it's not unregulated. Outside the US borders. It's regulated. It's regulated under the, retail, rules, the, under, the, under the rules of the broker. In order for a broker to offer the product, he has to be regulated to be able to offer that product. So we have segregated, you know, a, a European broker will have segregation of customer funds and uh, it has to have all of his legal agreements in place. So it's perhaps not being regulated. Uh, the word in America may be regulated, other people will say it's strangulated. There's, you know, there's, uh, well, there's Dan, a lot going on there. Dan, are you asking, just to clarify, are you asking about <laughs> The, the level of regulation, or are you saying in an OTC market structure versus an exchange market structure? I think you've got the more okay. correct words. So <laughs> we live with our FX options under the SEC regulatory regime. Yours, coming with Dodd-Frank, have a, a, a jurisdictional um, oversight. So it's definitely a market structure play. And it's one that's going to play out over time. I think the, the markets can live, uh, certainly live side by side as they do today. Uh, as you say, you can trade, uh, you can trade uh, on the NASDAQ, you can trade on the CME, the, the uh, futures, uh, FX futures options. Uh, and the, the volume that's taking place right now of the 330 billion of, uh, of trading a day, about, I don't know, probably 321 billion of that is being done OTC. And, uh, and that's a, that market hasn't grown in a uh, wild west kind of uh, market. It's a, it's a tremendously well-served market. It's grown because of the liquidity that's offered by the participants. And the part that's been missing is retail. Retail hasn't had access. And that's been, I guess, for many factors. But now, with technology, we can offer platforms. We can tie into the exchanges. We can offer liquidity. And we can, I think, see great growth in this product. And seeing, uh, I mean, again, similarities between where options were, as, as most of you know, options were over the counter. Broker picks up the phone. Um, and they, they traded them that way. There was, before the CBOE started, there wasn't that consolidated market. Um, I wish we had a $330 billion options trading over the counter for Apple and all the rest of the things that I like to trade because the ARB opportunities would be fantastic. And so I would think that the fact that you've got a big liquid market like this, $330 billion in OTC uh, options trading, for FX should be something that could be a significant driver for anything that is listed. Because again, uh, for those that didn't want the contraparty risk, for those that, that wanted the transparency and the, uh, uh, the unification of the standard, standardization I guess I'll call it, for the uh, product, that would be, you know, the, the ARBs that should go back and forth across that should be fantastic. 
I think one thing to think about for, for, uh, for this market is to think about where's the demand coming from? Why do people want to trade FX options? And if you think back 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when the retail FX market began, I think a lot of people said, FX? Who wants to trade FX? Why would an American who doesn't even know what foreign currency is <laughs> want to trade FX? And I think it was quite a surprise that, uh, that that market grew as it did. I think the equity options market grew in large part from the first trade that a retail guy does, which is he owns a stock, he sells a call. Right? The second trade, what does he do? Maybe he sells a put as a targeted buy. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know John could tell us. Nope. And then they right. start to evolve. And in FX, I don't think that have, they have that same uh, uh, basis for trading, the same need for trading. So it's probably going to be an evolution from equities over to FX. Somebody who's already familiar with options, a retail guy is familiar with options from the equity market, and he says, you know, I can apply this strategy in FX as well. But so far, he may not know that it exists, that it's available to him, to your point. Mm -hmm. I think we have to get that out. I think we have some good people in this audience who can help us get the message out that this is a great product to trade. Webinars, you know, content, a lot of people to partner with. And it's a, it's a growing space. And I just also don't want to forget, uh, it's not only about retail. I mean, the institutions are very well served by the banks today, and regulation is, going to, is changing that landscape to some extent. But there's also a, a very big audience that also doesn't have access to this market. The audience that can only call their one regional bank for an option price, and it's not a trading product. We can make it into a trading product. We give them a platform, family offices, hedge funds, small hedge funds, somebody that doesn't have a prime broker that doesn't have access to six banks now can use exchanges, can use our platforms to, to get access to this market. Okay, so let's take a little detour into the institutional space. Uh, Dan, I'll, if I could uh, call on you for this one. Um, we heard this morning, I guess, the long delayed rules for putting uh, FX options onto CEFs and exchanges that would probably be delayed even further than we thought. Nonetheless, um, you know, the exchanges are a way for people to trade institutional institutions and retail without any worries about you know, registering as a SEF dealer participant in any way. Um, at NASDAQ, are you kind of seeing that? Are you planning to you know, leverage the, that it, the attractiveness of that proposition to be able to trade FX options without you know, going through all these SEF-related um, regulatory hurdles? We have an ironclad sales outreach right now, and it comes to three words for exchange traded pro products. Mm -hmm. Straight through processing. That solves a lot of problems for participants who come in for the first time and say, I want to add this asset class. Well, every prime broker can add an exchange traded asset class. Maybe it's a, you know, you mentioned a family office, maybe they outsource to different managers, maybe they take trading advice. But at the end of the day, unless that trade can be executed without fear of trade breaks, they know the cost going in, they can't even get to the point of doing the trade. They've got to know what their economics are. That's what the exchange environment brings, is the confidence of straight through processing, fully regulated environment. And sure, under uh, Dodd-Frank, an exchange is the best friend to a chief regulatory officer at these major banks, who, by the way, must sign off at the end of the year that, yes, we're in compliance with all the rules. Whether they're on the future side, it's with the Commodity Exchange Act, or if it's on the security side, that they have all their ducks in a row. And that's the confidence that investors expect from their brokers that their house is in order. We as exchange underpin that ability for a broker to deliver service. That's where we think we win. And at the end of the day, those three words straight through processing is what we uh, hold out as our shingle for doing business. I thought the three I got words. A dash, big guy. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, very you much, John. Thank you. See you again. Thank you. Sorry about that. John, can we just have one thing before you go? Sure. Can we have from you a trade rec on FX options yeah. next week when you're on TV? That's all sure. we ask. I'll do it. <laughs> you pick the currency. Thanks. Bye now. Um, so to continue on, I just want to go back to something that was just touched on by John and uh, Stephen again, and it's the idea of um, sustainability of, of customers and keeping your customers around, uh, you know, educating them and sort of growing your business as they grow uh, rather than cycling through new customer bases all the time. Um, Stephen Best, again, going back to your conversations with, um, you know, spot FX dealers around the world, uh, brokers that is. Um, is that becoming more of a concern to them? Um, and do they see options as a potential way to, uh, to I, I shore up their businesses? The, the, the few brokers that have been successful offering the product um, have, uh, uh, you know, they have a couple of things in common. One, uh, usually internally there's a champion. There's somebody that kind of knows what an option is, which is important. Uh, I think 
also they understand that uh, there's two ways uh, that they can engage their existing client base with options. Uh, they can use options strategies to overlay their spot trading. And so uh, in that way, that allows their customers to be more sustainable and to last longer. Uh, those people that just kind of look at, I want the deposits and I'll find somebody else, um, usually don't find uh, the vision of options to be very compelling. Um, I think that's a, a short, that's a short, a short sighted way of looking at things. Um, you know, this, there's a lot of, I think, I don't know, 12, 13, 1400 brokers, FX brokers globally. Uh, and I, I don't know, I, I think it makes a lot of sense that if you're coming to the market to come with something that's different from everyone else. If you can differentiate yourself from your competitors, uh, it'll give you something different to talk to your customers about. And this, this is one way that you can do it. Stephen, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, I think that um, spot liquidity is excellent everywhere. And uh, advanced traders, experienced traders are, you know, who, who, who learn about options, I think are looking for options. And I think it's important for brokers to be able to offer it. It's important for customers to have access. And uh, I think it's important for brokers to be able to offer that in order to make, keep their customers. If I can just I'll Please. Add, add, add to that. Uh, I wouldn't want to name any names, but I have, I have customers, broker customers, who if you go to their website, it doesn't mention that they trade options. So uh, I think that there is a, there's, a, there's a fear about cannibalization uh, and um, you know, th they get over it over time. But to the extent that you're willing to, as I said at the outset, invest a little bit of resource uh, in training and in marketing, uh, the results will speak for themselves. Uh, getting into sort of like the, a softer uh, subject matter, more kind of um, subjective, I guess one of the debates that goes on, and all three of you I think have options backgrounds, is are options traders fundamentally different than spot traders, and can you make a spot trader into an options trader? Um, I was just wondering, this is uh, non-scientific, but I'll just throw it out there because I guess that is the whole, you know, for this audience, which is largely in the spot FX business, it's important, but not that we can solve that question today, but I'd be curious to hear your uh, perspectives. Uh, happy to start. Uh, options traders have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, you know, I could put it in other terms, but I, I don't think I can do that. I'm in America. But um, we, uh, a lot of uh, customers at the very retail end, customers are coming in making $500 deposits and learning how to trade with, with spot FX uh, are not necessarily great candidates for FX options because they don't have the knowledge. And I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit out there of customers who do know what options are. And there should be the first customers that should be using options that you should be going after. Um, most of the brokers set minimum deposit levels to, to let a customer trade options, even though uh, we'll trade options uh, on, on sizes as small as 10,000 of underlying, $10,000. So that could be a $50 option. But we don't want a customer depositing $100 and trading an option because it's just, uh, it's, it's, it, they're not going to really get anything out of it. If they can't get anything out of it, it's not in our interest either. So we set, low, uh, we set minimum deposit levels to let customer trade options, even at the very retail level. And it's going to take education. It's going to take time. I don't think, uh, even though options are 12% of the spot market overall, um, I don't know that 12% of the traders use options. I don't know. Dan or Stephen? Yes. Uh, what we observe at uh, NASDAQ is that we work with all the major online retail brokers from the security side. And they have a secular driver in their favor for increasing the level of interest from retail options traders. And it's zero interest rates. They can't earn a return on their investment pool that makes it, you know, set it and forget it. So they're looking for new ideas. And that very fact alone is driving interest from people that are coming in new to the options industry, just like you said, in terms of I'll sell a call or I'll sell a put. And that, you know, we probably have a limited lifespan of the next couple of years. So that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, we've been to a lot of uh, retail uh, forums for these investors, and they overflow the rooms. And they're all looking for rudimentary information, like John said, 
what is my risk going in? What's my commission going to be? How much money do I have to deposit? But the nice thing that we like that we see from the NASDAQ point of view is that these people are not coming in and going, um, yes, I got a $10,000 IRA. This is what I'm looking to invest in. They're coming in already conditioned. This is risk capital. Yes, I understand I could lose 100% of what I put in. And I think that's the synergy that needs to be in play here is full disclosure that this is a risk asset and you need to underlie, understand the risk coming in. Fortunately, we're seeing people adopt that and taking the first step in terms of their education, learning about the proper disclosures. That's important to market integrity and confidence amongst retail investors. I think in our experience, uh, it, just to address your, your question, uh, we see that uh, option traders, generally speaking, um, trade more, have larger deposits, and um, are our customers, customer for longer periods of time. Um, generally speaking, for FX option traders, I, I think that though there are two, generally speaking, two different types of them. There are those that have experience trading options, perhaps in another asset class. And you know, I, as you mentioned, I traded options for years, and I would, I would never trade an asset that there was not a derivative market for it. I would have no interest in trading that. And so people that trade in other asset classes often have that view. Um, but then there are other people who are FX that, are, that have been trained and are learning how to trade, how to, how to leverage options or use options in, the, in, their, in their trading. And, uh, and they, over time, start small but get bigger and use them more as they become more comfortable. Yeah, I, I know in uh, doing some research for the panel, the uh, Options Clearing Corp, or OIC, I forget, does a, every five years they do a survey of, of the industry. And um, it's always shown that the customers who trade options are basically the customers that are you know, the, the most desirable. They're interested in new products. They tend to have much larger uh, asset, you know, account sizes, um, and you know they're always interested in seeing something new. So if you're a broker or you know involved in the market at all, those are the kind of the customers you want. So it'd be great to to see that uh, grow in um, in foreign exchange. Um, well, we've come to the end of our panel. Um, we do have a little time. If there are any questions from the audience, be happy to address them to the audience. James. I can uh, tell you the, the interest is coming uh, from everywhere. I don't yet work with anyone in the U.S. I'm looking for a U.S. broker to work with. Um, so there would be definitely interest from the U.S. because you have the most educated marketplace uh, here in the U.S. from the options users. But uh, the biggest interest is coming from the EU. Right? For us right now, it's coming from the EU. Uh, and we're working through retail FX brokers. And uh, that's where we're finding experience. People, we have to go to markets where people know what options are. If we look at all of our broker customers and looked at their customers, their end trader customers, for some reason, the, the largest, it's not a majority, but the, the, the country with the largest number of end traders is Canada, uh, followed by, um, by Europe and then Asia for us. Yeah, for us, it's Canada, the UK. Those are the top two non-US destinations. I guess the Canadians, they like to trade up the options, so they're... And hockey. Yeah, hockey. <laughs> Olympic gold medal champions. It's, uh... As far as I know, only one of the panelists is from Canada. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, thank you. I know 31% of the world's population watches the World Cup, and uh, so I think we, we've got a good uh, audience in here today, and thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you.